We're going to go ahead and get started. What an exciting day for us to have a baptism here this morning in our church. Amen. Amen. And uh, it was just a few weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago, Dana came to me and said that uh, Kerrigan wanted to talk to me about uh, receiving Jesus as her Savior. So we are so proud to, that we're going to baptize her, but we're most proud that she has received Christ as her Lord and Savior. Amen. That's what it's all about. And so we're going to ask young Kerrigan Beauty to come down now as she's going to be baptized this morning. Kerrigan, we are so proud for you, so happy that you have invited Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, okay? And you've got a lot of family and friends here to share in this wonderful experience for you today. You want to look out at, at them so they can take your picture? All right. <laughs> See all these people that love you. Okay. Now, Kerrigan, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I now baptize you. It is wonderful to see all of our guests here. And Preacher Barry, thank you for coming uh, from First Baptist. And he's going back down so he can lead in his church this morning in their service. And, and, uh, and all of you, family and friends, who are here to share this wonderful experience for, for Kerrigan. This is her big day. And she's, she's a convert in the family of God now. Praise the Lord. Now, at this time... I'm going to, uh, I want to mention something to you. This is uh, March the 14th and uh, calendar year 2021. Uh, does anybody know what significance March 14th has for the life of West Pelzer Baptist Church? It's the day the church was founded. So 67 years ago today, a congregation said in here, was it in this building or is it another building? Jackie, can you help me? What building were they in? When it started. Okay, but that was 67 years ago today when the church was founded. So happy birthday to West Pelzer Baptist Church. Amen? Amen. All right, and God has brought us through a lot through the years, a lot of good times, a lot of hard times, but, uh, and, and Terry Blackston has a birthday tomorrow, and I know how old Terry is, <laughs> because his mama gave birth to him, brought him into this world one day after the church was founded, so, <laughs> so Terry was uh, not quite here yet. He was sort of here, I guess, but not quite all the way here into this world when the church was founded. But happy birthday to West Bowser Baptist Church. All right, Danny, if you'll uh, put on the screen my sermon title for this morning. And also, Danny, if you will notice on my sermon title um, screen, there is, a, there is a little poem that I want us to read together. I read this last week as I'm preaching on the spiritual warfare of God, And I read this last week, and I want you to look at the screen behind me. And I do hope that you'll be able to read those words. I hope that you can see them clearly. But I will begin, and I want us to read this together. And I want this to be our motto as Christian soldiers fighting in the spiritual warfare against the devil. So let's read together. I am a soldier in the army of my God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. The Holy Scripture is my code of conduct. Faith, prayer, and the Word are my weapons of warfare. I have been taught by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, tried by adversity, and tested by fire. I am a volunteer in this army, and I am enlisted for eternity. I will not get out, sell out, 
be talked out or pushed out. I am faithful, reliable, capable, and dependable. If my God needs me, I am there. I am a soldier. We are all soldiers in the army of God. Now, as soldiers in the family of God together in this army, let us open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, as you see on the screen. Ephesians chapter 6. And we are going to read this morning 13 through 15. Also, I will let all, all of you as family know that hopefully everything went right and well, but if it did, the baptism for Kerrigan should be on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can look at it and watch it on there as well, just to let you know that. Ephesians chapter 6, 13, 14, and 15 will be our text. Let's read. Wherefore, I take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. What are the shoes about? for the spiritual battle against the devil. I mean, you think about Paul, again, as I said one time before, was chained to or in the presence of a Roman guard for at least the majority of three years at one time. And he had plenty of time to look at the, the uniform and the gear and the, the weapons of the soldier. And he looks at the soldier, and he notices the belt. And when I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago, I said, why, when the soldier has a sword, when he has a shield, when he has a helmet and that massive, strong and powerful breastplate and all of that, and even other weapons like a dagger and a spear, why would he focus on a belt? And I I brought out showed that that belt was so very important is that, and that it held the, the uniform together and he would put other weapons on that belt too. So, and, and, I, and, and Paul realized the belt is like a belt of truth and, and I said that it represents the truth of God's word. Then he looked at the breastplate and he talked about that. We looked at that last week and now... Now, all of a sudden, he looks down at the shoes. Good gracious. I mean, the shoes, what in the world good would, or importance would they be in a, a spiritual war or in a physical war? Why would the shoes be? You'd, you'd be surprised how important those shoes were to the Roman soldier. For could you imagine, could you imagine, listen to this, an army is attacking, they're coming toward that Roman soldier, and he's got the uniform on, he's wearing the helmet, he's got the breastplate, he's got the shield, he's got the sword, he's got everything he needs, and there's a rugged battlefield, the terrain is absolutely rugged with rocks and debris, and, and the soldiers are coming toward him, he's got everything on, and he's barefooted. He's not ready to fight. He's not one bit ready because he is not going to be effective without the shoes on. The Roman soldier's shoes would resemble something like what you see on the screen. They were like sandals and they sometimes would resemble a boot in that the straps would go way on up high on the leg. On the bottoms, on the soles, they would have nails or some kind of little knobs or spikes for traction, so they could stand firm and so they could run and, and they would be able to, to be able to go through rugged terrain, like I said just a moment ago. So the shoes were very, very important. What significance do they have in the spiritual battle? I'll tell you. We'll see in just a moment that they are very important. 
You see, the Roman soldier's shoes in, were important to him in the physical battle, but in the spiritual battle, Paul said they are shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. And what does he mean by the preparation of the gospel of peace? It means that, hey, Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Now that verse has a universal intent and direction. In other words, it's for all Christians to witness to all people. We are, as children of God, to be in, ready in season and out of season to preach the gospel. You say, well, now first of all, two things. One, preach, I, 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 thought, I thought that that verse has reference to preachers and missionaries and evangelists. No, 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 no. Listen to me. The word preach is just simply an English word which means to speak. It means to speak forth words. If we know Jesus is our Lord and Savior, we need not zip our lips and be quiet about it. We need to go out and tell people about Jesus. So that verse is for all of us. But what about this in-season, out-of-season stuff? Does that mean there is a time when the gospel is out of season? No, no, no. Don't misunderstand. Uh, that's part of a verse in the Bible, be instant in season, out of season. 1 Timothy 4, 2. Paul said that to young Timothy. But in the English usage, in our English language, there's it's an idiom which means we are to be prepared no matter what season it is. We need to be ready at all times. I don't know if the Roman soldier during times of war would sleep in his shoes, but I have a sneaky feeling he might have because he had to always be prepared and ready to go at moment's notice. Now, we all as children of God need to always be prepared and ready to go and share the gospel to those who need to hear it. And this is what Paul said at a later time in Romans 10, 15. How shall they preach except they be sent? So then, the question of the moment is, have we been sent? I just read the marching orders. The marching orders from the commanding officer. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. So indeed, yes, we have been sent. If you believe that, say amen. amen. We have received the commanding officer's marching orders. Go, go, go. Now, then he went on and said in Romans 10, 15, how shall they preach except they be sent? Then he said, as it is written. And any time you see in the Bible where someone says, as it is written, that means he is quoting something. So Paul, who wrote this letter to the church of Ephesus, said this. He quoted from Nahum 1.15 and Isaiah 52.7. He said, how beautiful are the feet of them who preach the gospel of peace and bring good tidings of good things. So how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. It is a beautiful thing unto God when we obey the marching orders of the commanding officer and we get up off of the pew or wherever we might be sitting Put on the shoes, lace them up, and go. Where to do that? Listen to me. I'm going to share three things about the gospel of peace that we are to be sharing. We need to always be wearing the shoes. And we need to always be going. We need to be telling people Christ is the one who can bring peace in this tumultuous and hard, difficult world. Amen. I'll tell you three things now about the gospel of peace for us, and that is, number one, we need to make sure that we believe the gospel of peace is true. You see, Jesus said one day to his disciples, 
at a very difficult time for them. He had done, told them that he was going to die on the cross. They were greatly troubled and upset. And there were a lot of rumblings around Jerusalem at that time and what's going to happen and some people turning on Jesus. It was a really hard, difficult time for those disciples. Jesus told them, calm down, don't worry. He said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. I'm going to leave, I'm going to die. I'm going to go unto heaven to be with my father. But he said, peace I leave with you. My peace give I unto you, not as the world giveth unto you. Peace I leave with you. He said, neither let your heart be afraid, nor let it be a... He said, don't let your heart be afraid or troubled. So putting on the sandals of the gospel of peace means that we are prepared and ready to go and share it. But they'll know that the, the shoes of the gospel of peace, friends, listen to me, they'll do us no good if we wear them and don't go. And they also will do us no good if we wear them and yet don't believe the gospel of peace. Jesus said to those disciples, and I know that it was historically meant for them, but it is spiritually applicable to us and everyone in every generation. Jesus said we can have peace in this hard world that we're in. Politicians will promise peace and don't deliver. Government leaders will promise peace and yet we still have war throughout this world. Jesus is the one who promises us that we can have peace in life. He is the only one who can truly give peace. And if he says, listen to me, if he says we can have peace in this life, then we can bank on it. We can believe it. Because everything he says is the truth. John said this about Jesus one day. In John 1.14, he said that he is, we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hear that? He was full of grace and truth. John said, Jesus is full of grace and truth. Hebrews 6.18 says, it is impossible, virtually, totally, completely, absolutely, definitely, without a doubt, impossible for God to lie. So if Jesus says that in this hard, treacherous, difficult, corrupt, complicated world that we're living in, that we can have peace, then listen, folks, we can have it. So let us put on the shoes and go to fight against the devil. The devil is on the attack. He is, who's he fighting? You and I. He fights the children of God. That's who he's after. He wants to destroy our lives. He wants to hurt us. He wants to divide us. He wants us to have hate and he wants us not to love one another. He wants us to have all kinds of difficulty and problems in this life. The devil is doing a number on us. He is on the warpath seeking whom he may devour. So we need to put on the shoes and go fight against the devil and say, Devil, you're not going to have your way against me in this life. For I believe that in the name of Jesus Christ that I can have peace in this troubled world. And we need to let other people know this too. There are people that are going through storms and they're afraid. People that are going through problems and they don't know what else to do, where else to turn, how they're going to handle this or how they're going to handle that. They can have that tranquility in Jesus. And we need to put on the sandals and fight against the devil and try to, to, and to, and to let them know that they can have peace. And when we do that, we're slapping the devil right in the face. We are. Because he wants to have, he wants us to have, be unsettled, to be troubled. Jesus wants us to have peace. Let's put on the sandals and go tell. Now the second thing I want you to notice here 
about those sandals is that in the gospel of peace, in the word of God, the gospel of peace, by the way, is the word of God. And in this word of God, it tells us two things that the gospel of peace is that we are to share. Number one, it is a reconciliation between us and God. So let's go all the way back to the garden. The Garden of Gethsemane, no, a whole lot further back than that. Let's go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Let's go all the way back to Adam and Eve, the first man, the first woman that God created. You know, we all jump on their case a lot of times, do we not? We all say, if Adam didn't do this, if Eve didn't, look, they were human. They were the first humans. They had an incredible relationship with God and with one another until the serpent slithered his way into the garden and messed everything up, but... You say, well, I wouldn't have done it. How do we know we wouldn't have done it? We very well might have done the very same thing Adam and Eve would have done, and I, and I really ver uh, completely believe that. They just happened to be the scapegoats that we read about in the Bible because they were the first ones created, and they were in that garden when they committed that sin against God. You know what happened? That caused division. All of a sudden now, they had become entrapped. All of a sudden now, they had become prisoners. All of a sudden now, they had become captive. They were in the hands of the devil, and, and there had to be a reconciliation between man and God. And there's no way it could be because of sin unless there would be a Savior. So for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten Son, so that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus came to be that reconciliation. You see, we were enemies before we got saved. Enemies to the cross of Christ. How could we be enemies to the cross of Christ? You know, you say, I could see some of the worst, despicable, horrible, nasty scoundrels in life being enemies to the cross of Christ. I will tell you some of the nicest gentlest, most gentle, that's gentle is not a word, most gentle, loving, kind people in the world can be enemies to the cross of Christ. It's not based on who we are as a person, but who we are in here and whether we know Christ is our Savior or not. And anyone is lost, if there be anyone in our assembly in here right now, and if you don't know Christ, you're an enemy to the cross of Christ, whether you believe it or not. Paul addressed that one time. He said this. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and I now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So there had to be a, a reconciliation, this peace treaty. There had to be a peace treaty. Someone had to bring us back to God because of sin that divided us. Someone, I want you to picture it like, a big river, no, 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 how about a big valley of fire? That sounds even better. We're on one side in this life, whether, and, and, and we don't know Christ yet, and so when the life comes to an end, we step off and into fire, which is hell. On the other side of that wide, wide valley of fire, hell is heaven. Problem is, we can't get there. Because if we go to hell, we can't go to heaven, we're going to burn. So how are we going to get to heaven? There, that's a dilemma because of sin. So what happened is, God sent his son to become that bridge. The bridge is made of two pieces of wood and three nails, my friends. And, and what happens is the bridge goes over hell into heaven. And so on this side, in this life, when we meet Jesus and we invite him as our Lord and Savior, as young Kerrigan did, then when that time comes that we breathe our last breath, we will cross over the bridge, which is over the cross, right into the presence of God in heaven. Ephesians 2.14 says that Jesus is our peace who hath made both one and broken down the walls of partition between us. It tells us this in 1 Peter 3.18. Peter said, 
Christ hath once suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us unto God. So Jesus died on the cross to bring us unto his Father in heaven, to bring us unto God. He became that bridge so we can go to heaven now. And then the second thing about the peace of God, that we are the, the gospel of peace, we're to share is not only is it a reconciliation between us and God, it is a tranquility. It is a release during a time of storm, during frightening times of our life, during times when our emotions are unsettling and we're just so, uh, we're just in, in trouble and troublesome times and we need peace. I, I can think of the disciples. This is one of my favorite favorite stories is about the disciples when they're out on the sea in the Sea of Galilee on the fishing boat when the storm came the winds were blowing and beating upon that boat the waves were rocking the boat and those disciples thought surely on this night surely on this night we are going to drown in this sea Jesus help us and Jesus arose it says in Mark 4 39 he arose and rebuked the wind and said into the sea peace be still and there was a great calm the wind seized and there was a great calm. So the, when we receive Christ, we have received the peace that he promised in John 14, 27. Peace where we can sing, it is well with my soul. But do not think that the Christian life is going to be like a bed of roses. It's going to have a lot of thorns in it. It's not easy. It's hard. And there are times when the storms come up in our life, even when we are saved. And that's when we call upon Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you. And he'll come and he'll calm that storm very often in our life. Sometimes he won't calm it, but, he, but I will promise you this. Hebrews 13, 5 says he won't leave us nor forsake us. He might just grab our hand and walk us through the storm. But we're not alone in this thing. We can have the peace of knowing that whether he calms the storm or not, he can give us the assurance of knowing he's with us and will walk with us through it and take care of us. Come on, let me hear an amen to this, please. Help me out. Amen. We must ground ourselves in the gospel of peace, too. To ground ourselves in the gospel of peace means we are to stand firmly planted into the word. As I said, the Roman soldier's shoes had spikes or nails or some little knobs on the bottom to give them traction. Colossians 1.23 says, we must, not, we must continue, we must continue, we must continue grounded and settled in the gospel of peace and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which we have heard. In preparing to fight the devil, we need to put on the shoes and we need to remember, read and remember God's word. And read and remember the, the verses that tell us about peace. And read and remember the stories in the Bible that reveal to us that peace comes from God. For example, I think of Noah and the ark when, this, when that storm came. Oh, the waters were coming down and they weren't used to rain back then. No, no, no. They, this is new to them. And they had an, an onslaught of rain. I mean, it was coming down. It was raining buckets. It was coming down, really, from the sky. And Noah had built that ark, and his family were on that ark. And, but, and they could have perished like everyone else, but because of grace, God saved them. And when the storm ended and the waters receded, Noah and his family came out, and God put a rainbow up in the sky. And God said, this means peace. God brought peace in a very hard time to Noah and his family. He can do that for us. I think of the Israelites when they were at the Red Sea and they heard the trampling sounds of the horse feet and the wheels rolling through the, 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 on the ground and the soldiers coming to attack the 600,000 Israelites who were getting ready to cross over the Red Sea. And they saw that massive ocean and the soldiers coming behind them. The people, I'm sure, were literally terrified. We're going to die here. I mean, 430 years of slavery in Egypt. And our, our ancestors and everyone has gone through this. 
It had been better if we stayed there than to perish right here and our blood to be shed at the border of the sea. Then Moses held up his rod and God parted that sea and the Israelites crossed over. And when they got to the other side, God put a cloud in the sky in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night. And God said to the Israelites, peace. I think of Paul and Silas when they were in the Philippian jail and they were laying down and their feet were in shackles and they, they, they knew that that night before sunrise the next morning, very likely they would have become martyrs and they would have. That's where they were headed. They were going to die. But around midnight, the Bible says, you look it up, it's true, Acts 16, 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas, they just had a peace of God to come over them. And what did they do? They started singing the gospel. They started praying and singing. The prisoners heard them, and God sent an earthquake, and God set them free. God said, peace unto you. At the moment of our salvation, God calmed the storm. God calmed the storm for you and I when we got saved. Hey, listen, it says this in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, therefore, having been justified, having been justified by grace, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul said in Philippians 4, 7, it's a peace that passeth all understanding. He said it this way. He said, peace that passeth all understanding. It shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we need to put on the shoes of the gospel of peace and ground ourselves into them. Read God's word, the gospel of peace. Memorize it. Study it. Know it. And then... See, we need to believe it is true, ground ourselves into it, then, well, we got the shoes on, let us not sit, let us go. A young child or a teenager will get some new shoes, the newest brand of most cool, popular shoes that come out on the market. And they'll say, can I have these pair of shoes? Parents, if we're smart, we'll take them to Walmart. But anyway, now I'm just... But if you do buy them these shoes and you pay $100, $200, $300, however much they cost, and you buy them those shoes, do you think they're going to sit at home and not go out and let their friends see them? They're gonna, they want to go out and let all their friends see their new shoes, won't they? Look at my cool shoes. Look what I got. They want them to see it. So we have the, the best shoes on. As Christians, we have put on the shoes of the gospel. Let us not sit idly by and do nothing. Let us go. What good are the shoes if we do not go? What good are the shoes if we do not believe? And what good are they if we don't go? Where to go, go, go. The, the shoes for the Roman soldier meant preparation. He's prepared. He's ready to go fight. He's unprepared if he's not wearing them. We are unprepared to fight the devil if we're not grounded in the word. We believe it is true. We're grounded in it. Let us go and share it. Let's be prepared. Be ready. Having on the shoes means preparation. Means being ready. We must go. Walk. No, go run. Why must we be running? Because there needs to be a sense of urgency. Because I will tell you I believe, as Jesus said, the end of time will be like it was in the days of Noah. I believe more than ever that the, the day is drawing nearer and nearer to when Christ comes for his bride. And I do believe that the end of the world will come before we know it. And I do believe that we need to be ready. And I do believe, I do believe that the devil knows this and the devil knows his time is running out. For as Peter said, he is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. I don't believe the devil's walking anymore. I believe he's running. Because the devil knows he's got a sense of urgency. He knows he's got to work hurriedly. He knows because his time is, is running out. 
His time is running out. It is going tick, 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 tick. And he hears the ticking on the clock. He knows his time is running out. So the devil is working overtime. He's working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How can the devil work like that? He's got demons who are working with him. They're working around the clock. So we need to always keep the shoes on. Never take them off. Never take them off. Be prepared always. Always ready. Always ready. Always ready to go, go, go. And tell people about the peace of God they can have. We need to do it. Because James 4.14 says, Where is you know not what shall be on the morrow. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then it vanisheth away. And then... 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, Behold, now is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. And Paul said to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 2, Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. In other words, always go. Remember the Beverly Hibbillies, Jed Clampett, and that song? They say, How did it go? Sit a spell. Take your shoes off. Y'all come back now. You hear? The devil, listen to this, the devil looks at us and he says, ah, come on, Christian, just sit a spell. Take your shoes off. Don't be in a hurry. Just sit a spell. Keep the shoes off. Relax. What does God say? I believe God says, put the shoes on. Lace them up. Lace them up tight. Keep them on. Always be ready. Always be prepared. Because you never know who you might come in contact with is living a troubled life that needs to hear about the peace of God. Always be on guard. Always be ready to fight against the devil. Let us pray.